For the past four weeks, we have been in the studio with Hebrew scholar Nehemia Gordon, and we have been allowing the Jews to interpret all the scriptures the Jews wrote, and at the end of the series, we promised we would give plenty of time for the Gentiles to interpret all the scriptures the Gentiles wrote. I really hate to see this come to an end because uh, there are very few people out there on planet Earth uh, that, that uh, I have access to uh, that I can learn from. But when I'm with Nehemiah uh, over these past 18 years that I've known him, uh, he's 20 years younger than I am. He's, uh, he, he's uh, uh, young enough to be my son, but yet, uh, anytime I get together with Nehemiah and the, the time that we spent together uh, here, uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, I, I get to immerse myself in such wisdom and knowledge in the scripture that I just don't get to do from any other source. And so uh, it has been my privilege to share his life with you. And I want to take you to a particular incident that is extremely important, uh, an incident that wove our lives together in a way that I could not have expected. And we go back to the week of September 3rd of 2001. I was in Costa Rica. I had just finished up uh, working on a project and I was praying and I heard the voice of the Almighty by the Spirit, I heard while praying, get a, a bag, pack it, get to America and get all of your material, get everything out of America, get it down to Costa Rica immediately. So the next day I was on a plane, I flew up, I got all my materials out of America down to Costa Rica. As soon as I arrived, I went out to dinner with some friends and I said, I feel such an urgency that there's something I need to do right now, I don't know what it is. And then Frank Hawks looked across the table and said, you need to go to Iceland. I said, that's it, I need to go to Iceland. Never thought of Iceland a day in my life. Here I am in a tropical paradise, Costa Rica, and the next thing is go to Iceland. Well, what I didn't know was going on that very week in Iceland is that the news media was playing over and over and over the words of the crazy man from Israel. That week, a man came from Israel and was on the news media that was broadcast all week long that the Muslims were about to do something so dramatic that it would change the entire world. He was called a racist, a bigot, the crazy man from Israel, and at the end of the week he got on a plane, but yet they kept playing that press release him actually saying this on Icelandic television over and over and over, and at the end of the week, on Sunday, he got on a plane and went back to Israel. On Sunday, I was on a plane for Iceland. I arrived after spending the, the night uh, uh, in Baltimore, waiting for the next flight to get over there, I arrived and having no idea why I was there. I prayed with the people that picked me up, having never met them before, I said, I have no idea why I'm here, will you pray with me? As we prayed outside of Ingi's bed and breakfast there outside of Reykjavik, I knew that when I woke up, I would have the answer. A few hours later, slamming fist on the door, and that was when Ingi opened the door, flung it open and said, something terrible has just happened in America. And I said, that is what I was waiting for not knowing what I was waiting for. Put on my house coat, walked in the other room, and I stood there and watched the second plane hit the World Trade Center. What I didn't know that was going on at that very time, which was in the middle of the afternoon in Israel, something profound that the Almighty was doing. Not only had the warning come from Israel to Iceland, in that day I was on national television, I was on national television all week long because I had a message to deliver and I didn't know what it was until I got there. But I did not know that what was happening in Israel at that very hour and would not find out for years was was something that would change my life and would have something major to do with what our program is today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna let Nehemi Gordon tell us a story of what happened on that afternoon in Israel that morning in New York City. Nehemi, tell so the Michael, story. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, so I was kind of minding my own business. I uh, was working on my master's degree at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem back in 2001, and I had a little research position which was on um, something called the Hebrew University Bible Project. And what I would do is I would sit there in this office with no windows and the walls were lined with books, 
uh, thousands and thousands of books. And I would just sit there with my stack of photographs and a stack of printed pages. And my job was to proofread what's called the Aleppo Codex. That's the most accurate copy of the Bible in existence. It was written in the year 924, completed in 924 in Tiberias by the master scribe Aaron ben Asher. And to this day, when they want to print a Bible in Hebrew, they base it on the Aleppo Codex. So my job was to make sure the printing they were doing at Hebrew University was perfect, matching the Aleppo Codex. It was very tedious. And, and, and you were you were like, in, uh, you know, well back in the line. You were proofing oh yeah. proofreaders who were proofing proofreaders. It had already been checked three times at least, or uh, maybe I was a third. And uh, coming along, it had been done already. I, I was, meaning by the time I got there, I'd sometimes sit there for eight hours and being checking every little minutia of dot, jot and tittle, and it was perfect. So you're kind of going crazy because you're like, you're looking for the mistakes. That's my job to find mistakes. And there are no mistakes. It's perfect. So I'm sitting there and I'm doing my job. And one of the things that for at that point for years I had been praying, it was a prayer I had, which is I wanted to know how to pronounce the father's name. As I went through my studies at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, one of the things I've been told is that we don't know the vowels of the father's name, of the name yud heh We know the consonants, no question about the consonants. They appear 6,827 times in the Aleppo Codex, but we don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, we, we, you know, Because in Hebrew, the, the vowels and the consonants are written as two different sets of symbols. The consonants are 22 consonants, letters, and then the vowels are a series of dots and dashes above and below and inside the letters. So my prayer was, Father, I want to call on your name. And I had read entire books with theories explaining, well, really it's pronounced Yahweh, and really it's pronounced Yehoah, and really it's pronounced, y you name it. And, I, and each one had some really good arguments. But at the end of the day, I said, well, I mean, how do I know which one is the truth? What I really want, my prayer was to be able to see it, definitive evidence in the word of God, in the Bible. Right? The Bible was preserved for us by these master scribes who were just very meticulous in their details. They, they, they preserved the pronunciation of words from one period of history to another period of history in, within the biblical time. I mean, it's very precise. And I thought, if only I could see how it was written in these early uh, vo vocalized manuscripts, the manuscripts of the vowels. But of course, as I had this job, one of the things I saw and I'd seen before is that they don't have the full set of vowels. Now, one of the things I, I was told, and everyone knows, it's a fact, it's common knowledge, which is that the vowels of the name, yud heh vav in the, in, the, in the Bible are the vowels of Adonai, which means Lord. And I immediately saw, as I was reading these manuscripts, uh, that that was simply, it was a fact and it was common knowledge, but it was factually untrue. Like, provably, definitively just untrue. Okay. Um, it's, now, now th th this is coming from someone whose actual job it is to be a proofreader, proofreader, proofreaders, so that the scientific, the most accurate version of the most important Hebrew document in the Jewish world is is accurate. Right. And, and so this is a right. you know, well, but but really, you didn't have to be a proofreader to see that when you looked in the in the mass manuscripts of the of the Bible, and particularly at that time, I had access to the Leningrad Codex and the Aleppo Codex. Um, you could, you, you'd be like me saying I have a full set of purple hair, right? You don't need to be a hairdresser to know that that's not true, <laughs> right? Um, it's that obvious. It was that obvious that the name yud heh did not have the vowels of Adonai. In fact, what it had were two vowels, and there was clearly a third vowel that was missing. Why, why is that clear that well, the third vowel was missing? Well, first yes. of all, it just was missing. Um, like it, it was, in other words, every letter in Hebrew in that context, there's a few exceptions, but basically every lead, letter in a word in Hebrew has to have a vowel attached to it. If it's at the end of a syllable, then it has a certain symbol that marks that. You know, the exception would be like a, a final hey, which actually the name does have. But mm -hmm. the first three letters of yud, hey, vav, hey, that yud, hey, and vav had to have some vowel symbol associated with it. Even if it was the end of a syllable, there had to be some symbol associated with each letter. So is, uh, you would say it's unpronounceable? It was the, the absolutely way unpronounceable. Was, in other okay. words, it was intentionally written repeatedly in both the Leningrad Codex and the Aleppo Codex in a way that no reader no Jewish reader who read Hebrew, whether it was the simplest uh, uh, you know, farmer or the, the master scribe would be able to read it the way it was written. It was mm, impossible mm, to read. Mm -hmm. And this was very frustrating to me. And I had noticed this sometime before. 
And, um, and I had this prayer. It was this burning desire. Father, I want to know what your name is. And not based on some man's theory, but the way it was preserved by the scribes. But the scribes didn't preserve it a way I could pronounce it. So I'm sitting there minding my own business and, and I'm looking through. And you have to understand, every page of the Bible, I'm looking at four sets of symbols that I have to make sure are copied exactly precisely. Um, we have consonants, vowels, accents, and what's called Masoretic notes. And it's my job to make sure those four sets of symbols in the Aleppo Codex are transferred to this printed Bible. And, and like I said, it had been done before. And really the type of thing I, I was finding is, you know, well, there's a little uh, a Masoretic note and it's in the wrong position, so let's correct that and move it. I mean, it, it was relatively trivial things that I was able to find because it was just so precisely done. And um, as I was doing this, I you know, I would come across the name yud heh saw it all, all the time, almost on every page, and, you know, noticed day after day that one of the vowels was missing, making it unpronounceable. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and I find a place where the missing vowel is not missing. And it was Ezekiel 3.12, and it says, Baruch kavod Yehovah mi makomo. Blessed is the glory of Yehovah from his place. And I looked at that word yud heh which was unpronounceable, and all of a sudden it had a full set of vowels, which were Yehovah. And just at that moment, I get a phone call, and the voice on the other end of the phone says, a plane just flew in the World Trade Center. And I thought, you know, that's some kind of fluke. I didn't know. I didn't have a, you know, internet access. I didn't, you know, have a smartphone. They didn't exist yet. Um, I, you know, all I knew is this person on the other end of the phone said a plane. I, you know, I figured it was like a Cessna or something, like crop duster, you know, some small thing. I don't know. I put down the phone. I'm not even thinking about that. You know, maybe that was some kind of accident. What I'm thinking about is, is this a fluke? I just found the name with full vowels in the manuscript, in the Aleppo Codex, the most accurate manuscript. Um, so I said, okay, I'm putting aside my work. My job is to check four sets of symbols. I'm gonna check one word, and I'm gonna just skim the pages, looking just for that one word to find a second witness. And I'm skimming the pages, page after page, Keep coming across yud heh the name of the Father, and the vowels missing again, unpronounceable. And I thought, well, it was at one time. I need a second witness. I'm flipping, I'm flipping, and then all of a sudden, after about 15 minutes, I come across it. It's Ezekiel 28, 20, uh, 22. Again in Ezekiel. And, as again mm -hmm. in Ezekiel. And this one's actually really significant. It's a prophecy, and I was reading Ezekiel. That's why I found it there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a prophecy about Sidon. And it says, and you shall prophesy concerning it, and you shall say, thus says Lord Yehovah. And Yehovah there had the full vowels, Yehovah. And what's interesting there is by tradition, when the wor word yud heh appears next to Adonai, which is Lord, you're to read it as Elohim, which is God. And so the, not only was this a full set of vowels showing you the name as Yehovah, by tradition, those are not the vowels that should have been in this word, yet those are the vowels the scribe put in there. And then I get a second phone call, and the person told me, a second plane just flew into the World Trade Center. And I realized, you know what, that wasn't an accident. I, at that time, I had no idea who was behind it, but I knew that was on purpose. And this couldn't be just an accident either. This was something, is, is, this isn't a fluke, that's for sure I knew. Now, um, I didn't realize the full significance. It took me time to process both things, both what happened on 9-11, probably mm -hmm. like it did for many people, and, and also what happened here, what I had found. And, and what I, I didn't fully realize the significance until the 10th anniversary of 9-11. I was speaking to a friend and, and telling, you know, reminiscing about what had happened. And he said, do you realize the significance of that timing? And, I, and I'll be honest, you know, there's this expression, people who miss the forest for the trees. I'm not looking at the trees, I'm looking at the, the leaves under a microscope at, their, at the cells of the leaves and I miss the, the, even the tree. Um, I'm a detail-oriented person, it's just in my nature. So I had missed this. He said, do you realize at that exact moment when those terrorists flew their planes into the towers and they shouted out the name of their God? Because that's what Allahu they do. Allahu Akbar. That's what they Allah do. Allah is greater. They right? proclaim the name of their God because maybe because their God is death, but they proclaim the name of their God because they're doing this in the name of their God, their, their death. And at that moment, the creator of the universe halfway across the world wanted his name to be known and allowed me to find this. And, and, and I, I'm the one who find it and didn't realize the full significance of that. And you have to understand, I really struggled with even sharing this because 
the tradition I come from, the Jewish tradition really frowns on um, anything too spiritual. No, no, just just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. I was sharing this at a at a, a conference a few years ago, and this old Jewish man comes up to me and says, why do you have to share the thing about the towers and the planes? Just show us what's in the manuscript. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's the tradition I came yeah. from. Uh -huh. but, but looking back now, this, to me, I'm convinced more than ever that this is the hand of God. And I'm going to share something, which I just told you the other day, and I just discovered myself. And I didn't know this in 9-11. I didn't know it on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. I found this out very recently. So one of the things I didn't know is how many times in the Aleppo Codex does the name appear with the full vowels? So the Aleppo Codex uh, is the Bible. There's a, the pages that are missing. So from the surviving pages, we have the name appearing about, about 4,000 times. And the question I had for years is how many times does the name appear with the full vowels in the Aleppo Codex? But the Aleppo Codex is about 600 pages that have survived. And I had looked through about a hundred of them and I found a third place. And, you know, I, I, my assumption was that if you spent an hour, you would find another place and another hour, another place. You know, if you knew what you were looking for, mm -hmm. that maybe every 30, 40 pages you'll find one. That was my assumption, right? Because I had found it within 15 minutes, tw twice. So I'm sure if you did that and you, and you, you know, had the eye for it, you'd find it twice about every 15 minutes, half hour, hour. Well, so recently I was uh, uh, working together with this gentleman who I call T-Bone. And uh, I had trained him through this interaction I had had um, with how to find the name with the full vowels in manuscripts. Now, he started out not reading Hebrew at all. And he could mm. identify the four letters of the father's name. Right. Uh -huh. And he had this passion, this desire to try to find the father's name with full vowels in more places. So I said, okay, you've done a few manuscripts. We've you know, worked together on that. Would you like to do the Aleppo Codex? It's about, I think it's 594 pages of strife, something like that. It's, it's, it's nearly 600 pages. And I figured I'm going to hear from him in two or three years. Three days later, he contacts me. He said, okay, I went through the whole thing. The whole thing? And he sent me a list of places <laughs> where he found it with the full vowels. I checked every single one. And some of them he was wrong. And some of them I'm like, oh, no, that, that's mold. Or that's, okay. uh, you know, that's, mm. that's, that's not a vowel. Uh, that's an accent mark called Ravia Mugrash. There, there's all kinds of things, little dots and dashes. You definitely know what you're looking at. Um, but at the end, it turned out there were six clear, definitive places that had the full vowels in the Aleppo Codex. In the entire thing. Out of 4,000 mm. places, there's only six with the full vowels. And I found two of those on 9-11. And guess what? There's only two in the book of Ezekiel. If I had been reading in the book of Jeremiah that day, I wouldn't have even found one, let alone two. Mm. If I'd been reading in the book of um, Isaiah, I would have found one, but not two. It was only in Ezekiel that I could have found those two in that span of time in those sections that I happened to be reading. And I didn't realize this. I thought, okay, well, this is clearly the hand of God. After years, I came to accept that I found it at this timing. And, but there was a dimension I didn't even know about until recently. That six times. I want to share the other times with the people. I I'm going to show it here on the, on the screen. So, um, okay. Now, can, let, can we do that? Yeah, yeah, we, we can do that. But uh, let, let me interrupt this because, uh, you know, what, what happened for me, you know, it was years yeah. later, I was uh, uh, working on the book of the Revelation. And mm. this, uh, the name of insult was really something, uh, the name of blasphemy. It, it speaks of the name of blasphemy. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work this thing through. And this name of blasphemy, you know, it, it just it hit me. This, uh, you know, as we're hearing more and more, mm -hmm. as we know, there is a, a Muslim terrorist act that is happening someplace in the world every day. And most, uh, most of most days, it's several times a day uh, uh, in the world. Right, if you and, take the entire world, that's true. That, that, that's, that's right. So it's not, America is not this, this, uh, the, the center of the universe here. Mm -hmm. we, we've got all over the world, this is happening. And what is it that we hear uh, just before in, in Israel? You know, how many times we hear, the last thing they say is Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater, and then bam, they, they blow themselves up, blow whatever up. And, and so I, I looked at this, what is a greater insult than to say this fictitious moon god is greater than the god of Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the name of insult really, really, really hit. And then realizing then when I heard your testimonies of what happened, when you found it, at the very moment these people are crying out, Allahu Akbar, 
Mm -hmm. And this, this, uh, this, this prophet from Israel came and said the Muslims to Iceland to say the Muslims were about to do something that was gonna change wow. the world. I, I'd never even heard that before, that's interesting. And then wow. I arrived the day after wow. he gets on a plane and leaves and I'm the one that goes on national television wow. because I'm told in Costa Rica, get on a plane and get to Iceland without having any idea why I'm there. And so that, that very day that really changed the world, mm. he is not going to let his name be unknown. You had been seeking it mm. your whole life. You've been crying out to him, you want mm. to know, and you're one of the few people that actually have the skill level. Mm. I mean, you know, th there are no, uh, you know, nobody who graduates from an America uh, seminary with Hebrew background that is paid to be a proofreader on the most important mm. manuscript on the planet. I'll I'll tell you something, Michael. I can tell you as a fact that other people discovered this before me. In, in other words, there, there was a, a group of people who took the Leningrad Codex, typed up every jot and tittle into a computerized form, and it was right there. So they had, with their fingers, typed those letters, typed the full vowels, and they didn't realize the significance of what they were typing up, up evidently because they didn't, as far as I know, nobody pointed this out and said, oh, here's the name with the full vowels that you normally doesn't have. You know, for example, the Aleppo Codex is mm -hmm. you know, 6,800 and, and that one is 28 times. And of those, about, about 50 have the full vowels. And even though that's they- That's in the Leningrad? That's in the Leningrad okay. Codex, mm -hmm. which is considered the second most important manuscript of the Bible after the Aleppo. So they had typed that up in the 90s. Um, and they, so they clearly had seen it yet they didn't, as far as I know, didn't say, hey, you know, over 6,000 times the name is unpronounceable except for about 50 times here it is pronounceable. They didn't put two and two together, even though literally their eyes were on it and they were typing it. They didn't, because they weren't asking the question, right? They were, right, as far right. as I know, they weren't even asking the question. They weren't looking for an answer. And I was, as you said, calling out and praying, Father, I want to call on your name and not according to the traditions of men, not according to someone's theory, not according to someone's hypothesis, but based on the oracles of God, the way it was preserved by the Hebrew scribes. And until you ask that question, you could be staring it right in the face and it won't matter. You won't, you won't realize the significance of it. And as an Orthodox Jew, you come from the background of never pronouncing oh, the name, having no correct. idea, and yeah. it was absolutely verboten. Right, right. Oh, and, and for, certainly as an Orthodox Jew, I knew the letters were yud heh vav -Hey. um, you know, but no, I... I even as an Orthodox Jew, I don't even think that was a question that, that I spent too much time on, really. Mm -hmm. It was, even when I became a Karaite, there was something kind of deep in my, in my, in my psyche where, let's just not go there. <laughs> That's kind of scary, you know, until things were just like thrown in my face, like seeing the silver scrolls of the priestly blessing from 650 BC, and it says, and they shall place my name on the children of Israel, and there it's written in Paleo-Hebrew. It's like, well, how can I ignore that? That's actually, the name that he, it says they'll place my name on the children of Israel appears in Paleo-Hebrew, yud heh vav -Hey. You know, and at that phrase, phase, I wasn't necessarily thinking of how to pronounce it. That wasn't so much the issue, is, but that's the name, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and that, you know, you, you can't place Adonai on the children of Israel and bless them. That's not what it says. Right, That's not what God right. instructed the sons of Aaron. It's placing the name. That's right, and there are no Yehovah. miracles that happen in that context. But placing his name, we've seen the miracles. You, you've seen miracles happen, people I mean, look, calling I, I, on the I name. I think God can do miracles whenever he wants. <laughs> and he doesn't, you know, okay. he doesn't need us to. Fair enough, know. fair enough. Um, so, so for me, what was significant is here we have the name in the manuscripts. It's not a theory. It's a fact that it's written as Yehovah. And at the time... I knew about it um, really up until a year ago. I knew about it in uh, uh, four manuscripts, and about a year ago I found the fifth manuscript. As we're speaking now, I know of the name in over 50 manuscripts. These early are Masoretic manuscripts, manuscripts of the Bible. Manuscripts of the Bible written by the Jewish scribes. Um, early master, if you include later Masoretic manuscripts, it's far more than 50. I'm just looking mm -hmm. at the earlier ones. Uh, that have vowels, and um, can, I, can I share some of these? Can I'm we, gonna we, interrupt. Okay. One last thing, because I don't wanna interrupt after this, because right. I, I have an idea where you're going on this, mm. but 2001, that is when, uh, you know, I went from Iceland, and moved mm. everything to Israel, and that's yeah. when I moved there permanently, began the production, mm -hmm. and I did my episode on the name, oh, okay. okay? Now, Yahweh has been his name like forever for me, okay? I, and once I did that 
particular episode of A Rude Awakening, and this was duplicated. It was in every country of the world, and you know, eventually hundreds of thousands of these episodes are mm-hmm. out there. I had made my commitment, and I really didn't want to listen to what he had to say, okay? You know, just honestly, I have too much invested in this, and, and yet, when the evidence started to come out, and I said, no, you know, I have got to be honest, I have got to listen to what he says, I have seen the miracles, I have seen the hand of the Almighty lead Nehemiah, I've seen him led by the Spirit, which broke all the rules that I was raised with. Okay, uh, God can't speak to a Jew, okay? <laughs> you know, who's not a believer in Yeshua? That, that, you know, that's where I was coming from, ladies and gentlemen, I have to admit. But yet I saw the hand of the Almighty lead him into the most amazing things that had perplexed me. And without him, I could never have published this because I wouldn't have had the final answer on the genealogy of Yeshua without Nehemiah. And it's because at that point I said, I've got to look at this. And when I did, and then I prayed for a miracle for a woman to be raised from the dead in the name of Yahovah, that was the final thing. I said, if you want me, it's now my responsibility, help get this message out in that I am to, to, uh, to stand behind Nehemiah 100%. I'm asking you to raise this woman from the dead and that is exactly what happened. Our whole staff was here to see that very event t- take place. Wow. And, so, and so ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, listen up. You are listening to the spirit of the living God leading us in this day and time. Well, Yeshua said, I will send you the spirit to lead you into all truth. You will see how that is now come to manifest. And, and so, Nehemiah, I'm just gonna shut up. With archeological technology advancing more rapidly than any period in recorded history, an ever-increasing number of ancient Hebrew manuscripts are coming to light, and amazing things are being revealed. It doesn't matter what school you went to, where you thought you learned Hebrew, we're gonna deal with things, ladies and gentlemen, that are revelation from heaven that have been set up for generations to come to pass. Michael Rood and Hebrew scholar Nehemia Gordon reveal the fulfillment of ancient prophecies in our present age in The Gentiles Shall Know My Name. Um, I looked through hundreds of manuscripts searching for this exact text. Will we listen to and heed this modern day miracle or will we ignore our master's voice and miss one of the greatest revelations of our time? Order The Gentile Shall Know My Name right now on DVD or Blu-ray. You'll get all five episodes as seen on Shabbat Night Live. Own this exclusive teaching now by phone or online. Hurry, this is a limited time offer. Nehemiah, speak. All right, and I want the people to see this for themselves. You know, I. I like to say, and I was born in Chicago and Illinois, but deep in my heart, I'm from Missouri, which is the show me state. So I want people to see this for themselves. So what I didn't know until recently, until this gentleman T-Bone helped me out and went through the entire Aleppo Codex line by line, and he found in uh, 1 Kings 8.11, it also has the full vowels. And there, I love what it says there. It says, Ki male kivod Yehovah et beit Yehovah. For the glory of Yehovah fills the house of Yehovah. Now the first time, the second time it says yud vav it doesn't have the full vowels. It's unpronounceable technically, but the first time it does. And, and what happened was you had these scribes and they were copying letter by letter and then they put in the vowels and they knew they had to leave out one of the vowels mm-hmm. to prevent people from speaking it. Mm-hmm. There was a group of uh, movement of Karite Jews specifically at that time in Eastern Persia who unlike all other rabbinical and Karite Jews said, this one particular faction said, we must speak the name. So these scribes, when they copied it, said, well, we're not gonna gonna enable them. We're gonna leave out one of the vowels to prevent them from pronouncing it and even preventing an innocent person who maybe doesn't know about the ban on the name or forgets from accidentally pronouncing the name. So you come across it most places, it's unpronounceable, but here's one of the six places in the Aleppo Codex where it's definitively um, has the full vowels, Yehovah. Um, here's another one, 2 Kings 20, verse 9. And, it's, and I love this. And, and this is actually uh, like, uh, it's kind of like one of those crossover episodes where like Batman shows up in, uh, in Superman. So this is Isaiah in the book of Kings, right? It's like, ah. what is Isaiah doing in the book of Kings? It's like where Batman shows up in the Superman movie. And Isaiah says, this is for you the sign. Me'et Yehovah from Yehovah, and there Yehovah is the full of owls. And I have to wonder, as the scribe is copying this and he knows he needs to leave out the vowel so those troublemaker Karaites don't pronounce it or other people don't pronounce it, 
and something in him puts that dot in there. And, and it, it's beautiful. It, it's amazing. Now, I've had people say, well, okay, that's just two manuscripts, the Leningrad and the Aleppo. Well, I found it in over 50 manuscripts. And I'm going to jump ahead and share some of the other ones with the people. Um, so the six most important manuscripts of the Bible, indisputably, when they print a Bible, they base it on the Aleppo Codex, but the Aleppo Codex has missing pages. So they compare it with five other Bibles. The Leningrad Codex, something called the British Library, or 4445, um, Cairo Codex of the Prophets, Damascus Crown, and Sassoon 1053. Those are the six key manuscripts of the Bible with vowels. Um, they're all from the uh, uh, 9th and 10th century. The earliest one is the Cairo Codex of the Prophets from 895. The latest one is the Lenin Codex, which is uh, actually from 1008. It's, just, it's the latest one of, of the group. And all six of them have the full vowels. Here it is in the Leningrad Codex, Leviticus 25, 17. And I love the verse once again. Ki ani Yehovah Elohechem, for I am Yehovah your God, and you can't miss it. It has the full vowels. It says Yehovah. That's a fact. It's not an opinion. It's not a theory. It's not something someone had in a vision. Which And, and you know what? Maybe people have had visions. I've had people you know, write to me and say, well, but God personally told me his name is Yahuashi. I, I can't argue with what God personally told you. Here it is in the manuscripts, <laughs> the oracles of God. Um, or 4445 in the British Library, Leviticus 22.9. It says, Ani Yehovah Mekadsham. I am Yehovah who sanctifies them. And indisputably there, it's the full vowels. Cairo Codex of the Prophets, Ezekiel 7.14. Again in Ezekiel, he says, Vidatem ki Ani Yehovah. And you shall know that I am Yehovah. And I love this one in Damascus Crown. It's the Shema. Mm. In Deuteronomy mm. 6.4, it's when they asked Yeshua, what's the most important commandment? And in uh, the version, I believe, in Mark, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And here it says, Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad, Ve'ahavta et Yehovah Elohecha b'chol avavecha. And three times in a row, three really? times in a row, Yehovah has the full vowels. <laughs> Incredible, incredible. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, um, I could go through everyone. Here's the Sassoon 1053. I don't have time to go through all the manuscripts. I want to bring the highlights. And some of the highlights I have are special types of manuscripts. Now, the most accurate manuscript, even in ancient times, it was recognized that the most accurate manuscript of the Bible in existence was the Aleppo Codex written by the master scribe Aaron ben Asher, completed in Tiberias in the year 924. It turns out we have two manuscripts written by Aaron ben Asher's father, which is significant because where do you think Aaron learned how to write Bibles? Mm -hmm. From his father, mm -hmm. um, whose name was Moshe ben Asher, Moses ben Asher. Uh, ben Asher wasn't the name of his father, meaning Ben means son, but that was the name of the family. So the Ben Asher family of scribes go back to around the year 600 AD at least. And uh, the, so the father, Moshe Ben Asher, wrote the Cairo Codex of the Prophets in the year 895, which I already oh, showed, yeah, had the full yeah. vowels. What I recently learned is that there was a second Moshe Ben Asher manuscript, which is in the Russian National Library in St. Petersburg, Russia. And that's the location where they have over 1,500 Bible manuscripts. Uh, many of them, not all of them, but many of them are from this early period. And one of them, uh, which is known as Ivray 2, Ivray means Hebrew manuscript, Ivray 2, B188, uh, meaning it's 188 out of 1,500. And that is from the year 908, also written by Moshe Ben Asher, and it also has oh. the full vowels. Um, now, what's really, really cool, Michael, is for, 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 for years, I mean, since the 90s, when I was studying biblical, actually even in the 80s, back when I was in high school and I was studying about the Bible and I wanted to know where did our Bible come from? And I would read about the Ben Asher family back then in the 80s. Uh, I, would, I would sneak out of high school and go down to downtown Chicago to the Spurtis College of Judaica and read these books about, the, about where we got our Bible. And it came from the Ben Asher family of scribes in Tiberias between around the year 600 and 1000. And the greatest of them was Ben Asher and his father Moshe Ben Asher and there were other ones. And I had read even back then in the 80s that there was a rival family of scribe called the Ben Naftali family. So you had Ben Asher and Ben Naftali. But Ben Naftali, we don't have their manuscripts anymore. We only have Ben Asher. That's what I knew back from the 80s. 
that's what I knew even six months ago. And as I was researching this topic, and, and, and I, I want to back up, I shared in a previous episode about how I found 10 rabbis who say the name is Yehovah. And when I found that a few months ago, I decided I have 10 rabbis, but only at that time five manuscripts of the Bible with the full vowels. I said, I need to find 10 manuscripts of the Bible. And I thought, how will I do this? It's been 16 years since I discovered this. And in 16 years, I only knew about five manuscripts. And now I want to double that to 10. And what I didn't know is at the time I was, just at the time I was doing this, there's a worldwide concerted effort to digitize all Hebrew manuscripts. So I was able to look at manuscripts that just a year ago I wouldn't have been able to see. And as I was delving through these manuscripts, I found two Ben Naftali manuscripts. The rival Incredible. family of scribes to Ben Asher, and you have to understand. And, and they, these didn't exist as far as the well, they, scholar world they was existed. concerned. They existed, I just didn't know about right. them, and maybe two or three people in the world knew about them. But if you could read the manual of Masoretic Studies, and it will tell you they don't exist. What it will tell you is we have a list of what's called the differences between Ben Asher and Ben Naftali. Uh, and so we know, for example, and I know this sounds very technical, but for example, um, when you have in the Bible the word uh, to Israel, so in Ben Asher it will say Le Yisrael, and in Ben Naftali it will write Lisrael. It's, it's, a, it's a contraction, like you know you say in English cannot and can't, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and those are some of the identifying characteristics of Ben Naftali. And as far as I knew, that was just some, we only had the list of telling us the differences. And you can read the manuals on, on, on Masoretic studies, and it'll tell you, yeah, we don't have that anymore. Turns out, Two of the manuscripts have been identified that are Ben Naftali manuscripts definitively. Um, one of them is, uh, again, from the Russian National Library. This one is Ivray 2 B5. And the other one associated with Ben Naftali is uh, Ivray 2 B63. And both of those are Ben Naftali manuscripts, and both of them have the full vowels, Yehovah. So it's not only the Ben Asher family of scribes, it's their rivals mm. who also knew that the name was Yehovah and occasionally put that in their manuscripts. They also were part of this, you know, what I call the conspiracy of silence. Mm -hmm. They didn't want the Jewish multitude speaking this name, but in their head they knew it, and as they copied every once in a while, they put in those full vowels and show you it's Yehovah. And I gotta say that, you know, if it was a random dot, then you would have some places it would say Yehiva, and other places it would say Yehuva, mm -hmm. and other places it would say Yehava, but it never says that. It's always Yehovah um, whenever they put in the full vowels. So, very cool stuff, Ben Asher, Ben Naftali, and, and very, very recently I discovered an, the earliest dated manuscript that at least I've seen with my own eyes, which is, you know, I mentioned the Cairo Codex of the Prophets from 894. Turns out there's one that's one year older from the year 894. And this is also from the Russian National Library, which has probably the greatest collection of Hebrew manuscripts in the world. And this is a Vray to B100. And B100, what's really fascinating about this is this was the personal Bible of a famous rabbi named Sadja Gaon. Sadja Gaon was the leading rabbi of the 9th and 10th century. Um, he was actually literally the leading rabbi of the Jews of, um, of uh, uh, Babylon in the 10th century. And um, he had a famous dispute with one of the other rabbis, Ben Meir. Um, but what he's really famous for in Jewish history is he wrote a book proving that the oral law is true and the Karaites are wrong. So he's known as the bane of the Karaites, the one who came up and stood up to the Karaites and theologically slaughtered them and defended rabbinical Judaism against those Karaites who were denying the oral law. That's what, say Saad, you go into any Orthodox Jew and he'll say, oh yeah, the guy who, who refuted the Karaites. That's what he's known for. Mm. And we have his personal Bible, which is ah. unbelievable. His personal Bible, from it's dated to the year 894 when he was 12 years old. So he didn't copy this, but this was his, it may, it may have even been his bar mitzvah gift. Like this mm -hmm. is the Bible that he trained with. And we know that because it says it in the Bible. It says his name. Um, and uh, it has the full vowels, Yehovah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason that's significant is Aaron Ben Asher, the scribe from Tiberias, he was indisputably a Karite. He, we know 100%. There's a question of whether his father was. His father may have been a rabbinite. We don't know for sure. But there's no question Aaron ben Asher that wrote the Aleppo Codex was a Karite. The Cairo Codex of the Prophets is in the Karite synagogue in Cairo today. I mean, huh? that, 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 even to this day, that's where it is. 
And so the great opponent of the Karite, his Bible also has Yehovah. So this isn't just some crazy Karite thing. This is both Karite scribes and the leading rabbi, rabbinical leader of the 9th and 10th century has it in his Bible. So, I mean, these are two completely different witnesses that you can't argue, well, they were colluding to create some kind of lie. Mm. You know, if one of them would have changed the Bible and written something that the other knew not to be true, he would have been called out on it. And they would have said, can you believe those Karaites? They changed the Bible and made it Yehovah, and really it's Yehuvuhu. But we don't find that. That, that you won't, to find that, you'll have to go to Facebook. That doesn't exist on, <laughs> in, in any Jewish sources. Um, so we've got Ben Asher, Ben Naftali, Sadja Gaon, um, and we have over, I mean, right now I'm looking at a list here, and I'm going to scroll, I'm going to show this list to the people here. Uh, there's 52 different items on the list. One of them is in the Vatican. I've had people write to me, Nehemiah, you found all these manuscripts. Can you look and see if it's in the Vatican? Been there, done that. Mm -hmm. Manuscript, uh, uh, Hebrew 448 in the Vatican, which you can see online. That's the beauty of it. You know, we don't know what the Vatican's hiding, but we know they've put hundreds of Hebrew manuscripts online. These are manuscripts that they traveled around the Jewish communities of Europe and stole. You know, mm -hmm. they bring the Inquisition yeah. to town, go to the synagogue, burn all the Talmuds, or some of them, and they and they bring these manuscripts. And, and Michael, I, I want to just share something so people understand this is not a small thing that we're able to go online and see a manuscript of. Like it sounds trivial. Yeah, you went online and found some manuscript. This is when I when I was a kid in the '80s. We had this rabbi come and visit my school. I was going to a Jewish school in Chicago, an ultra orthodox school, and this was a rabbi who traveled, who spent months at a, a, of the year at a time in Rome, going to the Vatican every day. And the reason he did that is one of the most accurate copies of the Mishnah, now we're not talking about the Bible, of the Mishnah, the key book of the oral law, is the Vatican manuscript. And at the time, the Vatican would not let any Jew have a copy of this Vatican manuscript. In fact, he told us he would go into the Vatican and they'd let him see it, and he could sit there with it, but he wasn't allowed to take pen and paper. So, oh, and, and I remember this like it was yesterday. Wow. He came and talked to my whole school and he explained how he would go in there every day and he would sit there with the manuscript and he would read the, the sentences over and over, memorizing the vowels and the let consonants. And then he would run outside and write down outside he was allowed to and write down what he had seen. And then he'd go back a second time and he would memorize a page, and this guy had an, I mean, must have had some kind of amazing memory. And he would memorize another page, and he'd run outside and copy it down. And he did this day after day until he got uh, through the entire Mishnah, which is 63 tractates. It's not a small thing. So if I wanted to see the Vatican manuscript in the 1980s, I could have gone there and seen it, but I wouldn't have been able to take photos. I wouldn't be able to take a pen and paper. Now I can go online and take a screenshot. In fact, I'm going to show you a screenshot right now of this Vatican manuscript, which has the full vowels. Don't believe me, you can see it yourself. And here it is, one second. So this is a uh, manuscript. Now these haven't been seen by the outside world until you're putting them up on the screen, I mean, many it, of these. It, it, you could go and see it yourself if you wanna search through a manuscript online and you know how to do it, and you're not mistaking it for a Revia Mugrash or some kind, yeah. other kind of accident. Yeah, and, and some of these weren't even online just a few months ago. Uh, absolutely, uh, right. So. So, some of these are fresh online. And again, this is part of a worldwide effort by uh, universities and institutions to digitize all Hebrew manuscripts. So here, I love this passage. It's Genesis 21, 33 in the Vatican Hebrew 448 manuscript, folio 19R, and it's uh, Abraham, and it says, Vaikrasham b'shem Yehovah el olam. And he called there in the name of Yehovah, the eternal God. And there you see Yehovah with the full vowels in the Vatican manuscript that we don't have to go and, and you know, beg to see and then run out and copy. And then you'd have to take my word for it. You can see it for yourself. I mean, this is, this is amazing. We live in, in a time of increased knowledge, Michael. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. Um, I want to bring one other manuscript, and, and i got to give a preface to it, Michael. So... Um, well, maybe I'll bring a few more. So, so one of the really interesting uh, things that I, and again, I'd learned about this in the 80s at the Spurtis College of Judaica when I'm reading books when I'm supposed to be in high school and I'm reading these academic books about the Masoretic text. And one of the things I read is that the vowels we use today are the Tiberian pointing. Every Hebrew book you'll ever see has Tiberian pointing. 
Now, okay, but there's two other systems of pointing, of vowels, that existed in the Jewish history. And one of them is called Babylonian pointing. And the third one is called the Land of Israel pointing. Uh, in English, they, for some reason, call it Palestinian pointing. <laughs> in Hebrew, it's called Nikud Eretz Yisraeli, or Land of Israel pointing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason it's called pointing is that the vowels are a series of dots and dashes, a lot of dots. Um, so Tiberian pointing, both Ben Asher and Ben Naphtali were families in Tiberias. And every manuscript they produced was Tiberian pointing. Every Bible I ever read, every Israeli newspaper I paper I ever read, if it had vowels or book, has Tiberian pointing. Babylonian mm -hmm. pointing is a different system. And to be honest, I think I had seen a page here and a page there. Oh, you know, in Hebrew University, we, we learned uh, uh, the Targum in Aramaic, and that's written with um, Babylonian pointing. But I may have seen a page here and there of the, of the Bible until recently with Babylonian pointing, but one of my dreams in life was to find out what is the name Yehovah? Does that appear with vowels in Babylonian pointing? Hmm. And now that these manuscripts are accessible, I was able to search, and with the help of T-Bone, who is this gentleman who, who doesn't even know Hebrew, but he has this ability to identify God's name, and I've, you know, I've got to verify and check what he does, but he's got this incredible ability to scan. So together we found in a, London manu in a manuscript in London in the British Library, Oriental 1473, that's the designation of the manuscript, or 1473. It has Babylonian pointing, and it has the full vowels, Yehovah. And let me show it to the people here. I mean, it's, 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 it's breathtaking um, that you have this not only in the Tiberian system from Karaites and rabbinical Jews, Ben Asher and Ben Naphtali, you have it in the Babylonian pointing. And you have to understand, Michael, the Babylonian pointing isn't just a different set of symbols. It's not just a different font. The Babylonian pointing represents a different dialect of Hebrew. And what do I mean by that? So the name Moses in Hebrew is Moshe, but that's in Tiberian Hebrew. In Babylonian pointed Hebrew, it's not Moshe, it's Moshe. And so it's not just that the symbols look different, they're used in different places. Another example they bring is the word milchama, which is war. And in Babylonian Hebrew, it's malchama. Also means war, no difference in meaning, but it's pronounced differently and given a different vowel. And they could put the vowel milchama. They have the same, you know, some of the vowels are the same. Mm -hmm. They have an E, you know, they, they could put that in there, but it represents a different dialect of Hebrew. And, and, and most significantly perhaps is that uh, Tiberian Hebrew has seven vowels and Babylonian Hebrew only has six vowels. In other words, this goes back to the ancient tribes of Israel who spoke Hebrew differently with different mm -hmm. pronunciations. And both of those dialects of Hebrew preserve God's holy name, the name of the Father as Yehovah. Now, the Shva looks different and the Cholam looks different and the Kamatz looks different. You can see it here on the screen, but that is in Babylonian pointed Hebrew, a manuscript preserved in Yemen, Yehovah. I mean, it's, 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 at this point, we've got it from, we have it from Ben Asher, Ben Aftili, Sadia Gaon himself, the, the leading rabbi, and Babylonian pointing, which is a completely different dialect of Hebrew. You have in all those different sources. It, it's quite definitive. I want to bring something else, Michael, and this is a bit technical, so I want the people to bear with me. And I call this, Michael, I call this the B-52 bomber of Hebrew manuscripts. And the reason I call it that, it's kind of cute. So B-52 is the, is the shelf designation in the, uh, you know, the shelf mark in the Russian National Library. You know, it goes up to 1,500 or so, and this is the 52nd manuscript that they cataloged. B, Bible, Bible, 52. right, it's, it's Bible manuscript number 52. I call it the B-52 bomber of Hebrew <laughs> manuscripts. Now, I wanna back up before I bring the name, and I wanna talk about Adonai. The word Adonai, which means Lord, legitimately appears in the Hebrew Bible over 400 times. I think it's about 434, something like that, give or take, times. And it means Lord. Like when Moses prays to God, he says, be Adonai, which means, oh, my Lord. So Adonai appears in the Bible about 400 plus times. The name Yehovah appears 6,827. So it's clearly more emphasized and more important. So this is very technical, guys. Bear with me. I'm going to show you this, guys. So when Adonai is preceded by a preposition, I know people who are tuning out when they hear prepositions, when it's preceded by the word to, in Hebrew, when you say to the Lord, that's la Adonai, 
La means two. La Adonai. And you get this uh, cluster of la a. And Hebrew does this thing just like English does. You say cannot, you say can't. La Adonai becomes la Adonai. And what happens is the vowel drops from the aleph and the aleph is silent. And in fact, it doesn't have a vowel attached to it to show you that the aleph is silent. This happens a lot with aleph. For example, the aleph in Barry's sheet has no vowel. And that's not right. unusual with aleph. Um, so aleph in the middle of a word, for example. Hey in the middle of the word, that, that is extremely unusual. It's, there's specific examples where it can't. One example where it can happen, not in the name. But the aleph of Adonai is silent in Ladonai. Why is this important? The argument is, they say, yeah, Nehemiah, you found this in 52 manuscripts, wonderful. But don't you know, you're so silly, those aren't the vowels of Yehovah, of the name, they're the vowels of Adonai. And that thing that you say is an eh, the shva, it really is the ah of Adonai, and there's some rule of guttural letters of why it's not written that way. And if that makes no sense to you, you're following, because like, like that's complete gibberish, what I just, I'm quoting what they're saying, and it's utter, okay. utter gibberish. So here's the thing. They're claiming when I see Yehovah, E-O-A, that that E belongs to Adonai. We just established when Adonai is preceded by the two, by la, by the word that means two in Hebrew, there's no vowel in the Aleph. So what would happen if I showed you Yehovah preceded by the Lamed? Should there be a vowel in the Yud? And the answer is obviously not, because that vowel represents the Aleph of Adonai. That's their claim. And here it is in the B-52 bomber. In this manuscript, we have La Yehovah. And not only does it have the O, which is usually missing, it has the Shva in the Yud. And you can't say that that Shva, that I of Yehovah, that that belongs to the Aleph of Adonai, because the Aleph of Adonai doesn't have a vowel in La Adonai, La Adonai. It's, the vowel is dropped. So this is the B-52 bomber of manuscripts, Michael. I've discovered five manuscripts that have the same phenomenon. Five manuscripts I found where it has La Yehovah. And by the way, it's not just La Yehovah, it's Ka Yehovah, Va Yehovah, and Ba Yehovah. It's, it's, three, it's three prepositions and the word and. Where uh, that the Aleph in Adonai uh, is silent, and so the Yud should have no vowel, and it has the vowels Yehovah. This can only belong to the name Yehovah, to the name of the Father. It can't have anything to do with Adonai. <clears throat> and I read people, I read you the, the people, um, the quote from the rabbi in 1896 who says, there's no trace here of the vowels of Adonai. I think I read that. He says in 1896, Jacob Backrach, he says, there's no trace here of the word Adonai. These are the vowels that belong to the name of the Father alone and nothing else. And this is proven definitively by the manuscripts. One last thing, again, a little bit technical. So, and I see I have two minutes, so I'll do this real fast. So when the final hey of, Hebrew, of, the, of, of a word is silent, sometimes the scribe wrote a line over it to indicate that. That line is called rafe. It shows you the hey is silent. Um, it ha in fact, I'm, in the example I'm showing here with La Yehovah, you see the word Isha, which means fire offering, and the hey and Isha is silent, so they wrote a line over it. They didn't always do it, but often they did it in some manuscripts. Now, in this La Yehovah and, and uh, five other manuscripts, six manuscripts, there is Yehovah with a line over the hey that shows you the final hey is silent. Okay, no problem. But if those are the vowels of Adonai, the y, the final letter of Adonai is not silent. And so there's no way that that line, that Raphael line that tells you the last letter is silent could have anything to do with Adonai. This proves definitively that this, these are the vowels of the name of the creator of the universe, of the Father. And, I, and I've, I can't emphasize how important this is because the opponents to this will say, but the prepositions, what about the prepositions? Oh my God, the prepositions. They show you that, this is, that these are not the vowels of the name, they're the vowels of Adonai, and here it's the very prepositions that prove definitively that these are the vowels of the name of the Father alone. Boom, drop the mic. I mean, so it's over. <laughs> it's it. So... 
All those who call upon the name of Yehovah will be saved, the Gentiles in the end of days who repent and admit that we have inherited lies from our forefathers, then the Gentiles will be made, will, he will make known his hand is might and they will know his name. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. Now, uh, uh, two decades uh, in which uh, I, I've been involved with Nehemi on this and, and it, it's time for everyone to take this seriously. If, uh, if you're around, people say, oh, no, no, I, I've got reasons why, and I know his name is this, I know his name is that. Until people, until you have read his book, Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, and they have watched this entire series and the one that we did before then, until then, ladies and gentlemen, all it is is blowing smoke. All it is is pretending uh, we, we have listened to and seen so many representations on, on the internet, on YouTube, of people just making bald-faced lies as statements, in fact, who know nothing about what they're talking about, but yet are pulling people down a path. We're doing this to save your life. We're doing this because this is the Almighty making known his ways in this time because Israel must call upon the name of Yehovah. What's happen, going to happen in Jerusalem, it will be essential. What's happening among the Gentiles around the world, it will be essential because the day of trouble is upon us. The brimstone is about to hit the fan and this is the very time that the Almighty says, not only the Gentiles, but also all of Israel, the Jews, will call upon the name of Yehovah and will be saved. So. Nehemiah, thanks for being with us. It's Thank been you, a Michael. slice of heaven. And uh, would you please close with the Aaronic blessing yes. just as we read in the ancient text. Yehovah, you, you revealed this name to Moses. And in number six, you, you gave this name to Aaron and his descendants. And you said, and they shall place my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. And that blessing was Yevarechecha, Yehovah v'yishmerecha. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Ya'er Yehovah panav elecha v'chuneka. Yehovah shine his face towards you and be gracious towards you. Yisa Yehovah panav elecha. Yehovah lift his face towards you. V'yasem lecha shalom and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Well, you are all invited into the end time revival in which his name will be known throughout all of the earth. Shabbat Shalom to our fans, Shavu Tov. Have a good week. We'll see you back here next week. Shabbat Night Live. The Heathrow.